Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in this lecture we're going to begin a suite of lectures that focus on series solutions to differential equations. Now the purpose of what we're going to do is we're going to find a, a solutions to differential equations that are obtained by using power series. So that will mean a power series expansion where we need to identify the coefficients that solve our differential equation. Now, before we can even get into solving differential equations, we need to make sure that all of us are on the same footing. And so that means that in this lecture, we are going to review many of the important and basic properties of power series that you might have learned in a calculus class prior to this one. So what I will do is I will walk us through some properties, some important topics regarding power series, and then I will also intersperse this with a few examples. And then in the lectures that follow, we can start talking about differential equations again. So it's a brief pause, but it's an important and a critical pause. Okay, let's start right from the top. We are going to talk about power series. So remember what these things look like. They are an infinite summation. You have some coefficients a n and we have some central point. Remember these are sort of infinite polynomials and they are centered around, in my case, I'm going to call it x zero or x naught. Now in this case, this thing converges. It will converge at a point x, uh, a point pt x, if, well, if we have a very formal definition of this, and that is in terms of a limit, and that is that this limit, so if you start summing up, finitely many terms and you add more and more of those finitely many terms, then this thing actually converges. So this limit exists uh, for that X, right? So you're fixing a value of X. So you're not thinking about this as a function yet. When we talk about convergence, we're saying pick a value of X, then fix it in there. This now becomes a sum of numbers, right? Maybe took x equal to zero, maybe took it equal to one, maybe took it equal to negative pi, doesn't matter. You get an infinite sum, something like maybe one over n squared, right? That's a common infinite series that we encounter early on in calculus. So this is important, right? Because this will tell us whether or not uh, we actually converge as a power series, right? So if you can do this over a range of n. Now remember, there's a stronger version of convergence, and that is called absolute convergence. So let's take a look at it. This thing converges absolutely. So very, very strong notion of convergence. It converges absolutely at a point x. If, well, if you take the absolute value of all of the terms inside of this thing, so this will be, this converges at x, okay? So there are examples of series that converge uh, absolutely Sorry, absolute convergence implies convergence, right? But the opposite is not true. It is, there exist series that converge that are not absolutely convergent. Now, you can probably name one because we talk about it quite a bit. It's the common counter example that you encounter here. And that is the harmonic series. Summing up, you know, the, the reciprocal of all of the natural numbers, one over n, right? We know that that thing diverges, a very famous diversion series. It diverges extremely slowly, but it diverges. Uh, but we know that the alternating harmonic series, so add, uh, reversing adding and subtraction, so minus one over n to the n, that thing converges. So if you took the absolute value of that, you would get the harmonic series, which does not converge absolutely. So I want you to be careful here, right? 
Absolute convergence implies convergence, but not the other way around, all right? So maybe I can, uh, I can denote this with a little mathematical symbol, right? Two implies one here, but one does not imply two. Okay, now one of the things that we're gonna use a lot in this uh, lecture is the test for convergence or divergence, and that is called the ratio test. Now, when you learn infinite series, you learn all kinds of tests, and one of them that you learn is the ratio test. It's going to be the most powerful one. It's gonna be the one that we use over and over and over in this, in this lecture series. So we say if a n is not zero, right? We need to be able to divide here. And for fixed x, uh, then if this limit, so the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus one, the next term in the series, times x minus x zero to the n plus one, divided by a n, x minus x zero to the n, which you can actually uh, simplify this. This becomes x times x zero times the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus one over a n. Essentially, you're looking at the ratio of these coefficients in here, uh, which let's call this thing L. So I have a shorthand for it equals to L. So I'm assuming it converges then if that uh, limit exists, then the series converges absolutely if uh, L, the limit here, the ratio of these coefficients, times this piece that was out front, the distance x from the central point x0 is less than one. So if this limit is less than one, then the series will converge absolutely and it diverges if that thing is bigger than one. All right, so you might remember this. And in the case when this limit is equal to one, we see that it's inconclusive, right? So then we need a little bit more intricate methods. But nonetheless, this covers a wide range of territory, right? Because it tells us that we have absolute convergence when this ratio or when this limit is less than one, which we know absolute convergence implies just regular old convergence, which is good. Also, it tells us that we do not converge, we diverge when this limit is larger than one, right? So there's an edge case in the middle there, but that's okay, right? We can handle it. So let me show you with an example here. So here's my example. I want to know what values this infinite sum converges for. So again, infinite sum minus one to the n plus one, and then times n, and then x minus two to the power of n, all right? So my x zero term here is two. My a n term is minus one to the n plus one times n. So let's put this into my limit. I get the limit as n goes to infinity. Now the next term, actually let's pull out that uh, x minus x zero. So x minus two comes out of this thing. That's just this piece right here. And then I have my a n term. So the next one, this is minus one to the n plus two, right? I'm increasing n by one times n plus one divided by minus one to the n plus one times n. Now, the minus ones don't matter because I'm taking an absolute value. So this gives me x minus two, and then the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus one divided by n. That's a relatively easy limit to compute. Uh, this thing actually just gives you one and so the ratio test returns x minus two. So the absolute value of x minus two. Now you wanna know what values of x does this thing converge absolutely for? Well, let's throw the ratio test at it. So we know that we converge 
So converge absolutely. Well, in this case, this is when x minus 2 is less than 1, which we can open that thing up. This is minus 1 is less than x minus 2, which is less than 1, which is the same as saying 1 is less than x, which is less than 3. So this thing, this series right here, it converges absolutely for every x between 1 and 3. Similarly, we can say it diverges when x minus 2 is bigger than 1. And in this case, it's just the, the open part uh, left out of this. So x is bigger than 3 or x is less than 1. And now what you can see is that there's some edge cases that need to be dealt with. So we can ask ourselves what happens when we look at the endpoints. So in these cases, these are the ones that are not covered by the ratio test. So let's look at x equal to 1 first. When x is equal to 1, what does the series become? Well, the series becomes 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1, and then times n, and then I get minus 1 to the n. Okay, so in this case, this is equal to minus, so we can just multiply these two into each other, 2 to the n plus 1, that's the same as minus 1, and so I get the sum of all the natural numbers. This thing diverges, right? Okay, so at one of the endpoints, I diverge. Now let's take a look at the other endpoint. Well, in this case, I get something quite similar. I get minus 1 to the n plus 1, and then times n, and now I get 3 minus 2 to the n. That's just 1 to the power of n. Right, so this is just the alternating sum of all the natural numbers, right? So it's in this case, uh, my, uh, 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus 5. And again, in this case, we know it diverges. So here's the beauty of the ratio test, right? It takes most of the hard work from determining a convergence of a series away from us. Because essentially, you're just computing this little tiny limit here. A lot of the times, that's not a difficult thing to do. And the ratio test tells you most of the values of x that this works for. The only thing that it leaves out is a couple endpoints for you. And then you can go in and you can check that, right? So you only really need to check the convergence at two values of x, the endpoints. Other than that, not too bad. Okay. So here's another property, right? So something that we can see from right here is that we get an interval of values that we converge for. So we can say that if a series, right? So I just don't want to have to write this every single time. I'm just going to say series here to represent this thing that I keep writing over and over and over again. If this converges at x equal to x1, well, then it converges absolutely uh, for all x such that x minus x0 is less than x minus x1, right? So what this is saying is that if you can identify a value where you converge for your series, doesn't have to be converging absolutely, just has to converge, then, sorry, this should be x0, then for every single x that is closer to your central point than the point that you found that you converge at, you have to have absolute convergence, right? That is a very, very interesting piece, right? Essentially, this tells you that the regions of x where you converge are whole intervals. So similarly, you can say this with divergence, if the series diverges, so diverges, at x equal to x1, it diverges 
for all x such that, so for every x that is further from the central point, so x minus x naught is bigger than x1 minus x naught. All right, so for example, if I went back to this one and I just put in x is equal to four, I compute that that thing diverges, then I know that every number that is within uh, or more than two units on the real line from two, right? That's four minus two, that's two units, the distance on the real line, then it's going to diverge for every other point, right? So this is sort of the principle that underlies a lot of the ratio test, right? But we're putting it into words and you can see it in action with this example. So what this essentially means, what this leads to, so I, I could really call this 4a and 4b, but this tells me that there exists, we typically use the Greek letter rho, which is a non-negative number, which we call the, now let's emphasize this with a new color, we call this thing the radius of conversions. Right, so this is probably a term you heard before in your calculus class. Uh, such that, well, the series, again, I'm just using the word series to represent this thing. I don't want to have to write every time. Uh, my writing isn't the best, and also it's, it's a bit of a pain. So the radius of, such that the series converges absolutely uh, for all x minus x naught less than rho and diverges for all x minus x naught bigger than rho. Again, this is giving you something that you kind of already knew from the ratio test, right? Essentially, it wants this limit to be less than one. In this case, you get your rho is equal to one over L, right? So in this case, we call this the, um, the interval of convergence. The interval of convergence. Now, what was the interval of convergence for this example right here? The interval of convergence was x minus 2 in absolute value is less than 1. And we actually opened it up. We saw that that interval is just 1 less than x, which is less than 3. In our case here, rho was equal to 1. Let's look at another example, okay? Let's keep it rolling. It's good to use examples to really sort of build up uh, intuition. Even if you've seen this before, even if you're a little bit bored, that's okay, right? It's good to sort of refresh ourselves, dust off the cobwebs, and, and really see if we can remember what's going on here. So let's look at this series, okay? So I'm gonna start counting at one, just for a little bit of fun. X plus one, uh, in this case, to the N divided by n times 2 to the n. So I'm going to need the ratio test here. So let's say ratio test. Well, the limit is n goes to infinity. And remember, we're just going to pull that x plus 1 term out. Uh, we already saw how it behaves inside of the ratio test, so it doesn't really matter. What we really care about is the a n term. A n in this case is 1 over n times 2 to the n. So this becomes 1 over n plus 1 times 2 to the n plus 1 divided by 1 over n 2 to the n. And so here, this becomes, well, we can sort of rearrange this nicely. We get the x plus 1 in absolute value over 2. That's coming from the ratio of these exponential terms. And then I get something very, very similar to what I saw in the last example, except now it's the inverse. But in this case, it's still equal to 1. Right? So this just becomes x plus 1 over 2. So what is the interval of convergence here. Well, in this case, L is equal to one half. Remember, I just said that the radius of convergence is one over L. So therefore, rho is equal to one over L. So one over one half, which is equal to two. And we have convergence 
and converge absolutely for x plus 1 less than 2. Okay, so that's my interval of convergence. Now, just for fun, let's check the endpoints, right? We want to know, again, when we use the uh, ratio test, we're really sort of saddled with two endpoints that we need to check. So let's take a look. x equal to 1, okay? If I put x equal to 1 in here, I get... I get 2 to the n on the top, I get 2 to the n on the bottom, I get the old famous harmonic series. This thing diverges. Okay, no good, right? So the endpoint x equal to 1 is no good for me. Let's take a look at the other endpoint. That's x equal to minus 3. And this gives me n equal to, uh, sorry, 1, pardon me, I did, I made the same mistake above, but it doesn't really matter where you start, it just matters that it's infinite, and in this case you get, so, minus 2 to the n, so once you divide off the 2 to the n here, it becomes minus 1 to the n over n, which, this is the alternating harmonic series, this converges. This is a weird one though, right? We know that it converges, but not absolutely. So, all of this comes together, it says that we converge for, well, in our case, minus 3 less than or equal to x, which is less than 1. It's a half open interval, right? The endpoint x equal to 1 doesn't work for us, but the endpoint x equal to minus 3 does. Let's keep going. So, let's look at another case. So, I am going to use this notation f of x is equal to the sum of n equal to 0 to infinity a n x minus x naught to the n and g of x is equal to the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of b n x minus x naught to the n. So there are two series that are centered around exactly the same point and there's a lot of sort of information that's encoded in this. Basically, I'm using these functions f of x and g of x as shorthands. And what this means is that these functions only exist in places that these converge, and the value of those functions are whatever these things converge to, right? So maybe looking at this, you feel very comfortable, very natural, but I want you to really sort of dig deep and try and intuit what's being said with this, right? So this means, you know, these things are only defined where you actually have convergence. Well, we know a lot of properties about these things. So the first one is that you can add these together, right? So the first thing is that if you take f of x and you add it or subtract it to g of x, this is just the same as doing a coefficient wise addition or subtraction of these two things, right? Take your an, take your bn, add or subtract at will. And also, Let's assume these things, they, so f and g converge for all x minus x naught less than rho. Well, what this tells us is that this also converges for all x minus x naught less than rho, right? So not only can you do a very, very simple addition here or subtraction, but also you get the same convergence properties, right? So anywhere that f and g are actually defined, you can sort of add them together. And that sort of makes sense, right? We, we have a good intuition for this, but again, it's important to sort of formalize these things sometimes. Similarly, you can multiply them. So you can take f of x times g of x, and in this case, you get a new sum, so again it can be written as a sum like this, it has say coefficient cn, and you can actually determine exactly what those coefficients are. These cn, they come from the binomial theorem. Now it's kind of a pain to actually show how this is done, because you need to do the multiplications, collect all the like terms. So let me just give you the answer. This is a0, b, n, plus a1, b, n, minus 1, all the way up to uh, a, n, minus 1, b, 1, plus
plus a n b zero. So if you look at the sum of all of the, the indices of what's being uh, multiplied here, they always add up to n. It's every single way that you can take coefficients in a and b and take their indices to add to, to n. And again, converges for the same values, okay? So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to rewrite it, so I'm going to use my arrow here. We can also, so also, if g of x naught uh, does not equal to zero, right? So if you evaluate at this center point, essentially this is, you know, c zero not equal to zero, so i.e. c zero not equal to zero, right? If that thing is not equal to zero, then you could actually do a division as well. And so in this case, you get maybe some coefficients dn x minus x naught. Now, the unfortunate part is I don't have a formula for you to actually find out what the dn's are. It's a bit of a pain. Mostly, I want you to know that there is a way to do this and that we can divide these things. And in this case, it converges for all x minus x naught less than some uh, let's say, let's call it eta this time, where uh, zero is less than or equal to eta, which is less than or equal to rho. Okay, so it's possible that you have a smaller radius of convergence here. So be careful. Adding and subtracting, same radius of convergence. Multiplying, same radius of convergence. Dividing, you could get a smaller radius of convergence. Now why? because it's possible that inside of the radius from g that you have a zero, right? Uh, that g is equal to zero for some value, then you can't do any more division. So you need to be very, very careful about the, the, the division here. But nonetheless, you know, it's sort of what we expected. So next, f is continuous and has derivatives of all orders. So if this is my form for f, because it's sort of this infinite polynomial, it inherits a lot of properties of polynomials, right? Polynomials are continuous. Polynomials have derivatives of every single order, so it's not too bad. And maybe 8b here is if you want to actually determine this thing, we remember from Taylor's theorem how we can actually find those coefficients a n, right? And this is what's known as a Taylor series. So when you talk about this thing converging to a function, that's when we start using the terminology Taylor series. When it's just given like this in terms of just an infinite sum, of these powers, we typically just call it a power series. Now, some people get confused about this. Taylor series, now really what Taylor was interested in was the error in approximation. That's what Taylor's theorem tells us. It tells us that if you truncate this infinite series, what's the error going to look like? How close are you to the original function? Taylor's theorem does not say that we can just do this expansion, right? This is just what's called a Taylor series, and this sort of follows from a lot of these properties of these, uh, of these power series. Okay, let's look at another one. So, let's say if f of x is equal to g of x for all x uh, in an interval, about x naught, well then, this implies that all of the coefficients are the same as well, right? So essentially, if you look back at what number nine says, that says that all of their derivatives evaluated at the central point x naught are equal to each other as well. And there's a particular case of this that we're actually going to use. So we're gonna say, in particular, Well, if we know that a power series is equal to zero, 
This will be used a lot as we proceed through the next lectures. This tells us that a n is equal to zero for all n greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So one of the things that we're going to have to do a lot in this class is change where we start counting from. So let's see this example right here. This is the sum from n equal to 2 to infinity of a n x n. And what I would like to do is I would like to start this counting from 0 instead of counting from 2, right? So we're going to encounter types of problems like this over and over. I have another example that will come up later in this lecture. But let's introduce a dummy variable, okay? Let's say let m equal to n minus 2. Now, what this means is that if n starts counting from 2, m starts counting from 0. Now, we can rearrange this to say that n is equal to m plus 2. And that means, well, we should also say m equal to 0 if and only if n is equal to 2. That means that we can put this into the differential or into this uh, series. And so this tells us that the sum of n equal to 2 to infinity of a n x to the n, this is the same as m equal to 0 to infinity. That's this piece. Now, replacing this, a m plus 2, that's replacing the n's here, x to the m plus 2. Now, a lot of people like to use n as their summation variable. This is just a dummy variable to tell you that you're counting from 0 all the way up to infinity. It doesn't matter if I call it m. It doesn't matter if I make up a symbol for that. I can use any Greek letter I want. It's just like variables that we see in integration problems as well. So a, a lot of the time what you're going to see me do is I'm going to go like this. I'm going to switch right back over to n. I like using n's for my series and it doesn't matter what I call it, right? Again, I could draw a giraffe here. As long as I'm consistent, doesn't matter. It's hidden inside of the sum. So maybe I use this to help me intuit how I should be changing this. But I want, to, I want to keep the integration variable as n going through this. Okay, let's do this again. Okay, let's look at another example. What I would like to do is I would like to look at this sum, n equal to 2 to infinity. And I'm going to say n plus 2 and then times n plus 1 an x minus x naught to, to the power of n plus 2, uh, n minus 2, pardon me. Now, this piece right here is referred to as the generic term, okay? Generic term. Now, a lot of the time, again, as we progress through this class, we are going to see that we want the exponent on the generic term to be n, because that will allow us to perform a lot of what I'm describing right here. So for example, if I want to add two series together, I need to have the same generic term, and I need to be counting from the same number, right? So the previous example shows us how we can rearrange to start counting from any number we'd like, what this example is going to show us is how we can get these things into the same generic term so we could maybe add them together or subtract them or do all kinds of the sort of fancy stuff that we are going to be doing as we progress through this class. So in this case, we want to replace n by n plus 2. So here's what we'll do. I am going to say n is equal to, now we know we go up to infinity. Before I get there, what I want is I want x minus x naught to the n. If you want to, wedge a step in the middle here where you use an m. Sometimes I have to do that on a scrap piece of paper, and it helps me to follow the computations. But what did we do here? We 
added two into this thing. And so that means that I am similarly going to have to add two into the indices here. And I'm going to have to add two into this, so n plus three, and add two into this, which is n plus four. But now, since I added two to everything in the sum, I am going to start two back from where I was, starting at zero. Again, if you want to, you can use an m as a dummy variable, just like I did up here, but I just want you to sort of see how we can rearrange this to get a nice generic term. Okay, here's my final example. We're gonna use a lot of the information that we have here, and we're gonna get ourselves to a nice result. So let's assume, let's assume that we have two sums that are equal to each other. So n equal to one to infinity of n times a n, x to the n minus one. And let's assume that this thing is equal to n equal to zero to infinity, a n x to the n. I wanna find what a n is, okay? I wanna be able to solve what this series actually is. Now, first of all, they have different generic terms, so I'm not gonna be able to work with them yet. Also, this one starts counting from one instead of zero. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to rearrange this thing right here. I would like my generic term to be x to the n, okay? So I'm gonna add one to every index, a n plus one and n plus one right here. Sorry that that's squeezed in on you. Since I added one here, I gotta subtract one on the sum and I never touched the term on the right. Okay, so I have two functions or two power series equal to each other. I'm going to evoke number 10. Number 10 tells me that my coefficients have to be the same. So I get n plus one times a n plus one is equal to a n. Now the reason I was able to do this is because they had the same uh, generic term, right? All of the things that are in front of x to the power of n are the same. That's what is being told to me by number 10 here. So what does this tell me? That if I want to get the next term in the sequence, I take the previous term and I subtract, or I sorry, I divide by n plus one. Okay, so let's let's start analyzing this little sequence right here and let's see if we can find a pattern. So let's say n equal to one. Well then a1 is equal to a0 divided by one. Okay, n equal to two, a2 is equal to a1 divided by two, which is the same as from the previous piece, a0 divided by two times one. All right, so I don't, I don't like to simplify the multiplication because I like to see the pattern that comes through. Let's go one more before we recognize this pattern, a3 is equal to a2 divided by three, which is a0 divided by three times two times one. You might have to use a few more n's here, that's fine with me, but I can see now that if I continue this, this gives me that a n is equal to whatever you started with, so you've got a little bit of variability in here, divided by n factorial. And so therefore, my sum, so let's return back here, we wanna know what I sum up to. This is equal to, well, let me factor out the a naught from every single term. And here now I get x to the n over n factorial. This is the power series of a function we are very well acquainted with, especially in this class, right? We see it over and over and over again. This is e to the x. So this thing adds up to a constant times e to the x. Now, before we conclude, think about that constant, right? If we think about this in terms of solutions to differential equations, that degree of freedom, a naught, might represent 
a constant coefficient that comes through from when we are finding solutions to a homogeneous equation, right? That's your C1 term, right? That's the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at in the next few videos where we're using these series that we just reviewed in this lecture here in order to solve ordinary differential equations. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video when we get to apply all of this and have a little bit of fun.